out. Um, are they? Yes, no? Okay, yeah, so they are going out. I'll provide the, um, the PDF if anyone wants, uh, wants a copy to look at and peruse. But we're, a, we're primarily a software security consulting firm. And what that means is we help companies everywhere from, or in every place from the design all the way up to the development and into the maintenance and, uh, and release of software. We help them build maintain and, and, uh, and sustain secure software and everything that goes into that. And of course, games are you know, just one form of software in a very unique and exciting industry. Um, you know, they come with it, their own set of uh, business risks, their own set of challenges, given that um, there are many different flavors of games, there's many different platforms that games can exist on, um, there's a lot of different revenue models, all of that. And so that's some of the things that we'll touch on and how threat modeling is unique to those various elements of the gaming industry. And so here's our rough agenda for today. I hope, can you guys see? Oh, all right, my mouse is apparently not non-existent, so that's okay. Um, so here's our rough agenda for today. And um, I'll try not to just read slides back to you and uh, actually talk through the slides instead of, uh, um, you know, read them, but um, yeah. All right, so, um, Getting things started, threat modeling, there's a lot of different nomenclature that goes around the industry on what threat modeling actually is. Um, there's a lot of different companies that have a different idea of what it means to threat model something. Um, the way we look at it at Sigital is a little bit different than some other folks. And we look at it very much in a, uh, in a control flow sense as opposed to a data flow. Um, but in general, threat modeling is the depiction of a system, and a system can be you know, one piece of software operating in a network can be, it can be, a, you know, a SOA-based infrastructure with many different web services interacting with one another hosted in the cloud. Um, a system can be a lot of things. Uh, it can be an embedded system that's running, you know, some customized proprietary operating system communicating over a bunch of proprietary network protocols um, with some, some back end doing something. Um, and basically, we're gonna build a pictographic representation of what that system is, all of the things that make up that system, and we're going to overlay that, that pictographic representation of the system with assets, controls, threats, trust boundaries, and we're gonna use that representation to kind of think about and represent various attack vectors that a set of threat, ac threat actors can carry out against a, against a system to compromise assets. And, you know, there's a lot of different security activities that are used and applied throughout the industry. You know, there's pen testing, there's, um, you know, you can do a lot of things with reconnaissance, like we've had all the, the red teaming and social engineering-esque talks today, the privacy talks today. You can learn a lot of stuff about organizations, about people fitting within an organization, um, you know, and, and we do all that stuff as well. But really that's a lot of pen testing stuff and, and source code review a lot of that helps you identify very tactical point in time bugs or issues that are happening at a, snapsh a snapshot in, uh, in time. So let's say a cross-site scripting issue or a SQL injection issue or buffer overflow, whatever the case may be. Um, a threat, threat modeling and, and design analysis is more focused on capturing and identifying the other, the other class of potential issues and that is design flaws. Um, and you know, research over time has shown that you know, design flaws and implementation bugs make up about 50-50 each uh, with regards to vulnerabilities that manifest within software systems. So to get started with talking about threat modeling in this presentation, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the syntax that we, uh, that we use here at Sigital. So we have, you know, assets, controls, threat agents, trust zones, attack vectors, and the attack surface. Um, and I'll iterate through each of these, just giving you a really quick kind of overview of what those are. After I have some beer. And the special is fantastic, by the way. I don't know who picked the special, but it is, it is good. Um, so assets. Um, assets are probably the, the most critical thing that we need to really think about when we're designing and building systems. Um, so an asset is any piece of sensitive functionality or sensitive information that needs to be protected. Um, anything in the system that needs to be protected, whether that's user passwords, whether that's financial data, um, whether that's game assets such as your, um, you know, a player's uh, inventory in a, 
uh, in a like an MMORPG game, whether that's in-app purchase content that you don't want somebody to have without paying for it, things to that effect. A control, alternatively, is the thing that protects the asset. Um, and that could be anything from parameterized queries if you're trying to defend against um, some value stored in a back-end database. That could be something like output encoding. Um, it could be any number of things. But controls protect assets, in short. A threat agent is an entity that is attempting to attack your system or intending to cause harm to your system or your organization. And as we can see in this little diagram on the, on the bottom right, a threat agent uses an attack vector to either circumvent or bypass a control to attack an asset or to attack a component which is holding some asset. And ultimately they're after that asset. And yeah, so you know, that's that's basically the, the biggest takeaway from from threat modeling that you're gonna get is the various ways in which threats or threat agents are going to be able to compromise assets. And thinking about and reasoning about these things while you're going through the design stages and then also after a system is all up and running, you can do this, this stuff again and you know, see the various ways in which you've already implemented your system and then you possibly you can go back, refactor things um, as needed to protect, uh, protect those sensitive assets. So thinking about what your threat should be. Um, so all threats are different, as I'm sure you guys um, you know and appreciate. You can have anything from you know, the, the script kiddies, the very, very basic threat actors who are just using a bunch of canned, packaged up tools, the point and click, uh, auto pwn, all of, that, all of that crap that they can find and download on the internet, to very, very sophisticated adversaries. Um, and that could be a single adversary. Um, in, the gaming, in the gaming industry, uh, you know, we typically don't think about skilled, advanced, uh, crazy threat actors, but the guys who really are doing in-depth game cracking and bypassing um, cheat engines or, or cheat detection engines, uh, doing a lot of that low-level reverse engineering and patching work, it really is complex stuff. And carrying out those attacks is, you know, it takes a lot of sophistication, it takes a lot of knowledge, it takes a lot of patience and understanding of the tool set used to do those things, so debuggers, disassemblers, um, things like that. And also, you know, if, if we reason about threat modeling in the context of other systems, like financial systems, for instance, uh, you can run into the case of the nation states, the organized crime, all of that. But these are just some of, the, some of the ways in which you can think about and break out various classes of threats that you want to reason about um, within your threat model. And so this is a little bit of a little bit of an eye strain this slide, but this is the the threat modeling process at a high level, and basically the at the start of it, I'll break it up into a couple of different chunks. At the start of it, we need to first understand what the system is, what it does, how it's built. Um, we usually do that from a from a security perspective, since security is oftentimes not embedded within the development lifecycle. We're kind of um, you know, outside looking in or advising inwards. Um, we usually do this through a series of interviews, artifact reviews, things to that effect. So we need to interface with the people who designed, who built, and who implemented this system to really understand everything that, that goes into it. And we can understand the various components that go into it, the network protocols um, that are used to stitch those components together, the trust boundaries, as in the, um, the network zones that various components fit into, um, we need to understand what the assets of the system are, where those actually live, the controls that protect them, things like that. Um, we, then, we then need to start, you know, going back to our previous slide, we then need to start reasoning about the threats that are relevant to our system. And once we understand the threat structure, we can overlay that information onto our system diagram that we've built at this stage. And so then we're about six or fifth bullet down? Yeah, fifth bullet down. Um, so once we've overlaid our threat structure onto our system diagram, we can start to enumerate and think through, you know, being the creative security individuals that we are, various doomsday scenarios or attack scenarios that can occur based on how things are built and laid out. And we can do this using, you know, not only our creativity and, and experience and what we've seen in other places and other systems that we've worked on, um, but we can use a set of canonical attack vectors based on various design patterns that are used. For instance, if you're using 
a third-party payment system um, that is you know, sending information over HTTP, you know certain attacks that are going to be vulnerable to that. If you know that a password storage scheme was built um, using the Spring framework, and it's you know, an older version of Spring, you can kind of, you can extrapolate that that password storage system was stored using an insecure password storage scheme and not something a little bit more, um, a little bit more progressive like an adaptive hash, um, for instance. So, um, you know, we build out these, these misuse abuse cases, these, these possible attack scenarios um, based on how, how the various threats um, exist within our system, where they exist within our system, what components that they can interact with. And once that's all done, you know, we sit back, we think about the results, and we use the threat model to identify potentially immediately exploitable things, but also use it as a guide to figure out where we might want to go and do more pen testing, more source code review, more secure design consulting, things like that. We use it to guide other areas of our security program. And these, uh, you know, these bullets are kind of an iterative process in many cases because, you know, if you are using a threat model as a living document within an organization, so if you're doing this internally, you have a, you know, a development team within your organization, a security team within your organization, you know, you can build a threat model once at the design stage, revisit it at different stages or different release cycles and see how things have changed, what new components have been added, things to that effect, what new controls have been added to address, um, address a potential threat things like that. So the business risks, you know, in, in any security context, we need to consider business risk. Because as security professionals, if we cannot illustrate business risk to, you know, the companies that we're working for or the companies that we're working with, if we're consulting, then it's very likely that we're not going to get anything done and that we're, you know, we just look like the boy who cried wolf. Um, like the Monty Python video earlier for those that, that saw it um, with the rabbit. So, you know, we need to be able to articulate what, what risk a particular vulnerability is going to cause that business. And in the gaming industry, we've got some unique risks. Um, you know, some of these are, you know, of course, overlapping with other, other industries. So denial of service, of course, is very common and, you know, financial services don't like denial of service just as much as gaming companies don't like denial of service. You know, account theft and account hijacking, obviously not a good thing in many, many systems. Um, however, piracy is one of those interesting things. Fraud is one of those interesting things. And cheating is one of those interesting things that can sometimes, you don't necessarily have to protect it based on the, based on the revenue model. You know, in, in many cases, it's not ideal. For instance, if you're releasing a single player game, you know, you don't want that game to be pirated, probably. You know, it depends on your business goals. Um, but it's more than likely you, you want certain DLP or, or uh, uh, DRM, rather, um, certain DRM controls in place to prevent that game from being just outright pirated, sold, and, and downloaded on Pirate Bay or, you know, insert file sharing or uh, torrent site here. And so breaking away from, you know, the secure design or, you know, the, the high assurance, you know, security, security wizards who are waving their hands at everything and saying, you know, stop, everything needs to be extremely secure, everything needs to be perfect before you can go to release, it may not always be the case in the gaming industry. And, you know, some assets and some, some patterns are worth really getting behind and really putting a lot of uh, eggs in those baskets to protect. And some are, you know, you may just want to outright allow them, depending on, you know, the revenue model or the business model of your game. Um, you know, if you're, if you're releasing a freemium game that's based all on uh, in-app purchases, you may not care how many people um, download that, or even if the game is 99 cents and your, your primary uh, form of revenue is coming from in-app purchases, you may not care if people are able to bypass that initial 99 cent purchase, as long as they still have to go through the IAP to download all that additional content. And so then we get into this, into this realm where we have the prevent, the control, monitor, or the allow. And you know, this, this stuff may change every so often depending on, again, the business model, the revenue model. Um, but from our experience, this is usually how things break down is, you know, these things on the left are stuff that we, we see companies, you know, outright, we know we have to protect this stuff day in, day out, this is what's important to our business, our, our reputation, and our, of course, our ongoing revenue stream. And the stuff in the middle is, eh, you know, we could go either way. We could invest in controls to monitor 
uh, certain, you know, monitor cheating to a certain threshold. And uh, for instance, with the game Titanfall, they monitor, um, they monitor cheating, and if they catch cheating at a certain threshold, they'll pair cheaters up as a way, as a deterrent, and have them fight against each other in their own little cheating, uh, you know, cheating match, cheating death match. Um, other things, if you if you are creating bots that get uh, that obtain a certain level of efficiency within a game, then you may get kicked off, or you may have items removed, or things like that. Um, so it, you know, it's all dependent on the business. So you know, we as security people can't just you know red flag everything and say you know this is an immediate problem. We have to consider the business risks. So moving past that, uh, modeling the system. So as I said, we're we build our threat model initially from a system model. So we have to, we have to pictographically construct what a, what a gaming system looks like. And again, that can be, a gaming system can be many, many things. It can be you know, anything from the Angry Birds mobile app um, or Candy Crush communicating with Facebook servers for, for authentication and sta uh, session state management. It could be uh, you know, a gaming system like an Xbox, Xbox One or PS4. It could be, you know, the, the MMORPG like World of Warcraft or, or League of Legends, things like that. Um, you know, these things are all, wi these examples are all wildly different with regards to platform, um, you know, revenue model, all of that, but it all kind of fits in. Um, and so we have, to, we have to figure out how that system is built, how control flows throughout the, uh, flows throughout the system from lower privileged users to higher privileged users or components. And we have to capture the various uh, app layer and network layer protocols that are stitching together all of those systems. And so this next slide, and you don't have to kind of read and interpret the entire thing, is a very, very, very basic um, system diagram. And you can ignore the, um, the legend on the bottom for right now. Um, but as, if, you, if you notice, we kind of have things broken up into, into three primary sections. Um, we have the, the internet facing, um, you know, kind of untrusted stuff on the, on the left, um, minus, the, minus the CDM right now, but um, the untrusted stuff on the left, so the player is over there, you know, the game client is installed on their system, the launcher and the patcher um, service is installed on their system, they have a web browser that can be used to, to interface with, um, with our game servers. Um, and then within our, within our game's data center, our, our own network environment, you know, we have all these different components. We have, you know, the, the servers, uh, the servers that are handling the distributed world and all the various components that exist on there. We have a centralized authentication service. We have, you know, payment. Um, we have a, a general uh, content-driven website. We have, a, um, you know, a payments website that's handling revenue, recurring revenue um, information collection and the actual processing. Um, and then some back-end databases, things to that effect. So, um, trust boundaries, and I'll, I'll go back here to, uh, well, let you guys read this and then I'll quick, click back really quickly. Um, trust boundaries, there's, there's two different types of trust boundaries uh, that we use anyways. And one is a, a system um, or a machine boundary, and that is you know, one server um, between another server. Those would be con considered two different machine boundaries. So um, if you have a database server, an application server, those are two different machine boundaries. And then you also have network boundaries or trust zones. And those are, you know, we have the player land um, over here. And, uh, well, you can't see where I'm pointing, but you have the player land up on the top left and then you have the data center. And you can get a little bit more granular if you, if you need to, and you can go into and zero in on, you know, restricted network zones within that organization's data center that might store, um, you know, PCI relevant um, data such as uh, payment, uh, payment systems or uh, uh, payment data being stored for recurring payments or you know, just general databases that are housing sensitive information. And um, so moving into the assets, um, these are just some generic assets again in, in our very overly simplified game, um, gaming system here. Um, you know, some, of the, some of the ones that we've reviewed have been you know, exponentially more complex and um, you know, I, I initially attempted to anonymize one of those and put it up on the slides, and it, uh, it almost gave me a stroke when I tried looking at it in PowerPoint, so, um, so I couldn't do that. Um, but these are some sample assets uh, relative to this particular game. So we have, 
you know, the general game content. So consider our, our sample game here is uh, something like World of Warcraft. And, you know, so you pay for the initial client to be installed on your system, you know, whether it's 20 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever. Um, you pay an ongoing subscription fee, so therefore you supply your credit card information. That credit, credit card information or whatever payment method you supply is stored and charged on a, on a recurring basis. And then you have a bunch of, uh, you have various assets. So you have your, your in-game inventory, your, um, the armor and stuff that you have, the weapons, um, the currency, the virtual currency that you have, um, the experience points and, and, uh, and such associated with your character. And then you have some other things like the, the data that influences uh, fraud and cheat detection services on the back end. And you know, we consider that an asset, again, because it's a sensitive piece of functionality or data uh, that we don't want to be manipulated because we don't want people cheating and defrauding our game. Um, and then on the internal side, uh, because we do also consider internal threats um, in many cases, and especially in this case, um, we have the, the customer service of the CSR accounts, and CSRs in many cases, as we you know, kind of talked about leading up to this um, in the various social engineering talks, um, CSRs and some other privileged, um, privileged people within an organization will have a lot of functionality that you know, they, they legitimately need for their, you know, for their business role, um, but unfortunately, if those people get compromised, if, they're, um, if their credentials get compromised, then you can do a lot of damage. And this is, you know, this is one of those areas where defense in depth is absolutely critical because oftentimes in the, in the CSR model, you have people with access to the most sensitive information in your system, um, you know, whether that's passwords, payment data, what have you, getting paid the least amount of money in you know, your security hierarchy. So your, um, you know, the, the model is just kind of flipped on its head. You have you know, it's, uh, it's like the cleaning ladies or the, the cleaning staff who have access to your entire building, whereas, you know, people within your organization who get, you know, compensated very well may not have that level of access. Same, same exact idea. So, and what I meant earlier by overlaying, um, and I apologize, I think some of these are coming a little bit fuzzy, but um, you'll be able to see it more clearly in the slides. But what I meant by overlaying onto the system model, um, the, the threat structure, this is exactly what I meant. So where an asset, uh, or where any of the components that we consider within the threat model lie, um, we place that exactly on the diagram. So for instance, with the, with the player database, um, over in the kind of middle right upper portion, um, we have two assets residing there. We have um, the player's information. Um, so that is you know the player's personal information, their account information, uh, things like that. And then we also have their credentials. Um, and there's you know other various assets throughout as you know as you guys can can read. So of course the controls again are the things that need to protect the the assets. They're the you know their their sole purpose in life is to protect an, a given asset. And so again these are just some of the controls within our simplified system that um, you know without making the diagram too too hard to interpret um, in a very quick manner. Um, we like to we like to pair the controls right up with the asset that they're protecting, and the reason that we do this is that when you're reasoning about a threat being able to access an asset, um, you know, and that that workflow representing a vulnerability, if you identify an asset on your on your threat model that does not have a control associated with it, then that very well may be, you know, a red flag for you as a security or, or designer to, to consider. Um, if, as a threat agent, I don't have to bypass, circumvent, beat a control to compromise something, then there's something wrong. Um, and we should maybe consider it and put some layers of defense around that. So a couple of canonical threats for, for the gaming industry, and you know, again, some of these are, um, you know, some of these are universal. You know, you always, almost always have to consider the internet-facing attacker who's just out there existing in the world just attacking your systems. Um, you have the malicious users, so the players who will actually pay for the game legitimately or download it legitimately, who after doing that, that initial bit of revenue, or giving you that initial bit of revenue, you know, and they may, they may steal it, who knows, but um, let's assume they just, uh, they just obtain the game, they then try to break it further, whether that's to buy it once 
crack it and then release it to the masses, whether that's buy it, you know, release some, uh, you know, release some weaponized exploits for it that allow mass uh, cheating at scale, um, whether that's compromising all of your in-app purchases and releasing those for, um, you know, plug and play for the masses. Um, you know, those kind of users are oftentimes, um, oftentimes the most, uh, you know, narrowed or zeroed in on uh, by the gaming industry just because of their, uh, the skill that, that come with that, uh, with that particular threat agent in many cases, um, you know, using the, the tool sets that they do. Um, you then have, um, you know, if you consider multiplayer games or land-based games, you have attackers, and this can actually kind of piggyback off of the, uh, the second bullet, you have attackers who reside on the same land, um, either exploiting the game client, sniffing game traffic, you know, performing other various cheats, like for instance, if I'm playing Counter-Strike, with a bunch of my friends on the same land, and you know, there's an exploit in Counter Strike that allows me to, you know, outright, uh, you know, win any game that um, within the the people playing on the same on the same land that I am, you know, I'm going to have a huge huge advantage over them. And you know, you can insert any exploit that you want into that um, into that hypothetical uh, scenario. Well, not so hypothetical, but into that scenario. And then you've got some internal, uh, some internal threats. So you may have, um, you know, a malicious uh, customer service representative. Um, again, with those, per with those people being paid the least amount of money in your organization, they have, they don't have as much motivation to say, you know, I'm going to really protect my 12.50 an hour, and I'm never going to betray this company. There's no way. I won't do it because if somebody strolls in and you know consider a very high security system and they're like, I will pay you fifty thousand dollars right now to do something nefarious, and I assure you it won't it won't show up in anybody's radar. You know they may not have the technical know-how to to understand that their activity is going to be logged, or you know they that fifty thousand dollars may just be too tempting, and they may take advantage of the the capabilities that they have in their role to do that nefarious thing. Whereas you know somebody who's um, you know, if you try to bribe a CISO with that amount of money, um, you know, you're going to have a much different response as that, as that briber. Um, then you have other, uh, you know, internal attackers such as just the internal LAN um, attacker. So somebody who just gets a job at a gaming company is residing on that internal network. Depending on how that network is segmented, you know, you may be able to do um, nefarious things as well. So if you look at, um, you know, s towards the top of our model, um, if you guys can see that, you've got some RESTful calls being made over um, clear text HTTP, including things to the authentication service, including things from the, the, payments, uh, the payments website. And right now, we don't have any segmentation around that. So an internal network attacker may very well be able to just sniff network traffic and get access to, um, uh, to user sessions, to user passwords, um, to payment data as it's being uh, passed around the internal network and ultimately into a database for storage, <coughs> things like that. All right, so using the threat model, um, if we step back, uh, well actually I'll go through the slide and then step back just a little bit. Um, I mentioned before with the pairing of the assets and controls, the big thing that you want to be able to, to step away from at the end of this is how are threats going to attack, attack my system? Um, are there any paths in which any one of the threats that I've kind of reasoned about, internal threat actors, um, you know, the malicious users, um, any of them, um, can reach an asset without having to go through a control, or if they do have to go through a control, how easy is that control to circumvent? Um, so we talked about the password storage uh, security just a little bit ago. Um, again, if you're using vulnerable libraries to do your password storage um, security, um, you know, and let's say you're, you're using this library that is, you know, has all these rave reviews on, um, you know, some, some, shady, uh, some shady website that says, you know, your passwords will never, you'll never be the next LinkedIn if you use this library to secure your passwords. And all it's doing is MD5 hashing them. Then, you know, you as the developer are putting yourself in a bad spot if that password database ever gets lifted because you will be the next LinkedIn. Um, your stuff will get cracked. And um, so you have to, you have to kind of quantify and reason about how strong those controls are that are protecting the assets. And you want them to be relative. You don't want, 
um, probably, you know, depending on your business, again, you don't want some high assurance, super secure control protecting some asset that you may not really care about. Um, you know, again, going back to that table of the things that we need to outright prevent and then uh, control and monitor. And then, of course, you, 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 you may allow them. Um, yeah, just, you know, make sure to tie it back into the business risks. So considering when to, when to do threat models. So, you know, this is just some ideas. Um, you know, within the development process, it's usually best to do somewhat of a, and this is more of a hypothetical um, over here on the left because you don't have a system to actually go and, you know, review. You can't validate anything in code. You can't validate anything by, you know, by launching an Nmap scan against it or by, you know, actually interfacing with it. So, you know, this is gonna be a very hypothetical, um, you know, hand wavy with the architects and developers discussion here on the left. Um, but it's gonna give you a good chance to really start to reason about how the security of your system uh, will come to be over time once you get into the test, um, you know, the testing, the coding, and the, and the builds. Um, and then, of course, once you actually have a, a product ready to test and, you know, start to analyze is the next big area that, you know, doing a threat model um, is very useful. And this is where, you know, these two stages, and then you can also do it after the fact once you're in production. And it's oftentimes when we get brought in to do, do threat models is you can have this living document that's kind of evolved over time. So a couple of things to, uh, uh, to consider specific to the gaming industry, and you know, I've, I've kind of hammered on this throughout the talk, is you know, different, different game genres are gonna have different, uh, different threat agents that you know, they're concerned about. They're gonna have different assets, and they're gonna have different controls that they use to protect those assets, because again, we may not want just a, a pointless control, because you know, development time is money. Um, and of course, the, the revenue model, all of that is going to be very different. So um, I'm a massive Batman fan. And um, you know, I have two tattoos and another one soon to come on Thursday uh, relevant to Batman. So I'm a Batman nerd. So um, you know, unfortunately, due to copyright, I can have Batman splashed all over this uh, presentation. However, um, I do want to illustrate um, the differences between these various revenue models. So just a quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with these two games or classes of games? All right, so a lot of people, that's excellent. Um, yes, and um, so the Batman Arkham games, for anyone who isn't familiar with them, they're, they're just single player games available for consoles, for, um, you can get them off of Steam, um, what have you, and you, know, you just, you play as Batman, you go kick ass, take names, and uh, you know, save the world, or save Gotham anyways. And um, it's very self-contained. There are some online challenges, but they're very limited. There are some uh, bits of D uh, DLC that you can download um, after you pay for them, or downloadable content. Um, but ultimately, it's very contained within the, the player's system. You're not playing against of other, a bunch of other players, um, all of that, whereas the DC Universe game is a free to download. There are some, some premium versions that you can download, um, but mostly it's a free to download MMORPG. And you select from a big class of characters, um, you know, you, uh, typical RPG, right? You, you select your character, your class, you start to go out, do missions, gain experience, gain, uh, you know, get items, all of that. And, you know, it's, it's a lot more long term to, you know, you're, you're just kind of working through this story that's relevant to the, the character and, and side that you're playing on. And so the, the risks that these two companies face are going to be two very, very, very different things. So cheating in the Batman Arkham games, it may not be relevant whatsoever. You know, a much bigger risk to the Batman Arkham games may be if, uh, you know, what if a user can, well, you know, piracy is, is one thing that I won't get into. Piracy is um, you know, a risk in both of these, but let's say piracy of the DLC content. So what if I'm able to, you know, automate the generation of accounts that have free access to DLC? Um, and this has happened in a couple of games, and I, I won't name which, and I don't believe it was, this was one of them, so I think I'm protected there. But um, there, you know, upon generating, or upon activating a new account, you were granted access to DLC content for a given game. And if you can script out the creation of new accounts, if there's no email registration or email activation, you know, we're gonna send you a link, you click on it, verify that you're the owner of this email, all of that. 
Um, but you can just create arbitrary accounts and then activate them through the game servers and get access to your DLC. You, as an attacker, could carry out this uh, this attack, download you know 50,000 um, instances of the DLC, and then go resell that at you know at your own price. Uh, you know that may be a huge hit to the revenue of you know Warner Brothers and their their Batman Arkham games. Uh, consequently, or uh, alternatively, with the DC Universe games, you know visible cheating is something that could very well destroy the game. Um, so visible, there's a very big difference between cheating, where, you know, and this falls into the kind of control and monitor stage, um, but cheating just on its own, if somebody can kind of just, you know, unbeknownst to anybody else, just kind of exist and get points and, you know, make themselves feel good about them, uh, you know, make, make themselves feel good while they're, you know, trapped inside for hours and hours on end figuring this out. Um, you know, that's kind of a minimal risk to the business. Whereas visible cheating where, you know, everywhere they walk, people just, you know, drop dead and all their inventory flows into their, um, their things. Or, um, you know, they can automatically win any uh, player versus player battle or, you know, things like that, even though they're grossly, um, uh, you know, grossly weaker or less prepared or less skilled or whatever than the person they're playing against. That oftentimes has a very, very bad reputation hit against the organization. And when people are not paying, or when people are not playing these games, they're not making the company money. So, you know, very similar to the first talk today about, you know, people are, they're investing all of these dollars to keep your eyes fixated on their content. It's the exact same idea here. So the longer that you exist in their game, even though it's a free to play game, you're making them more money through the, the in-app purchases, through, you know, advertisements that they're, uh, that they're shipping you through all of the things that they're collecting. So, you know, two very, very different examples, even though they're both, you know, Batman themed and from the same, uh, from the same set of studios. So some other things that, that need to be considered in the gaming industry, and this is, you know, a little bit more unique um, than many other industries because, you know, financial services, a lot of it's just web-based stuff. You interact with Chase.com. You know, Chase.com has a bunch of web services that it interacts with, and then it, you know, sends stuff back to database servers. Um, you know, many banks operate like this, um, and you know it's it's very similar for other industries. Gaming the the gaming industry is unique because you know they almost have to account for so many different platforms and and all that. And you know you've probably heard the term trusted unbusted, where you know you're trying to you're trying to ship trusted software, a trusted system, to something where an attacker has complete control over that over that thing. Um, and so there's been technologies that have been kind of pushed out to the masses, um, you know, commercial and free, and um, you know, just general design patterns to help protect against these things, like, like the ArcSan and Metaphoric um, commercial products, for instance, that do you know, binary security. So you can build your game, your game client, in such a way that it makes it harder to, revert, to conduct reverse engineering attacks. Reverse engineering attacks. Um, actually, we'll step back. Um, so, you know, in making it more difficult to conduct those attacks, you can kind of, um, you know, you can almost take the advantage away from the attacker and, and you know, can, uh, kind of keep the ball in your court, um, you know, when considering, um, you know, much more open platforms. So, for instance, uh, you know, in the, gaming, in the gaming industry, PCs are oftentimes considered the, you know, the, the hardest to test because of all the various configurations and um, and all of that than, let's say, game consoles, because game consoles ideally are supposed to be much more controlled. It's a very, it's a very controlled, restricted environment until you know, the homebrew community comes through and just kicks the doors down and, and says, you know, we're gonna install Linux on everything and you know, your system security is, is laughable. Um, so you know, testing on, on game consoles, there's not as much concern usually with protecting game clients on those consoles because they, they kind of inherit the trust, um, inherit the trust from the game console provider. Um, it's almost, uh, when you consider um, cloud-hosted PCs, it, has anyone heard of uh, NVIDIA's grid service, by chance? All right, so a few people. Um, so grid is a cloud-hosted gaming PC platform. So, you know, you basically have a gaming PC, a gaming rig that's, you know, hosted in their, in their cloud environment and you interact with it through, um, through a browser-like client. 
and you know they're trying to remove that element of you know the unknown the unknown platform being in the attackers um, being in the attackers hands and you know keeping that um, you know let, letting the game provider inherit the security properties of you know of their of their deployment um, yeah so you know threat modeling in general it's you know it's not a it's not a tool or a process that is specific to the gaming industry um, you know you can threat model all the things you can threat model you know in in the gaming industry specifically you can threat model that the the client itself that goes on the software so if we step back to um, you know our model here it would be that top left box you know you could get much much more granular with that top left box um, and how everything gets installed on that system um, so for instance one risk would be the fact that the the launcher and patcher is getting content from the CDM over HTTP and that fact may result in um, an attacker if, if that launcher patcher is running as administrator um, and it's receiving content over HTTP to you know download and execute some some executable code then you know as an attacker on the land I may be able to um, inject myself into that network connection force them to download a nefarious or malicious uh, executable and get it get that launcher to execute that code as uh, as admin on the user system gaining remote code execution rights um, you know that's one example you can you can threat model the the actual game platform itself so the game consoles those cloud hosted environments um, things like that you can threat model proprietary network protocols or authentication protocols um, all of the various server side components the distributed worlds um, you know the payment systems the storage systems all of that um, and my point in in uh, in pointing out you know all of these things that you can threat model is the fact that you know a lot of these things a lot of these patterns have been looked at in some way shape or form throughout our existence as a as a field um, and in software engineering there's you know it's it's pretty common to reuse components that are proven um, you know that have been well reviewed and that's you know that's why we rely on industry standards for encryption like AES because we know that AES has been reviewed by a lot a lot of smart people instead of you know trusting your mom and pop uh, shop cryptographer to say you know hey I got this awesome new crypto protocol that you might want to try because it's awesome and I haven't told anybody about it um, you know that should be a red flag and you probably want to stay away from that if you can um, but the point here is that you know software engineering is pulling from reliable and trusted components and in the gaming industry we can do the same thing not only from a from a software engineering and, and uh, development perspective when we're when we're building our components so you know using a a reliable game engine um, such as unreal or unity or or cry or you know any of those any of those uh, you know commercial triple-a studio um, uh, engines that have you know that are built on reliable and, and proven technologies um, but as you're building your back end you know use um, use trusted updated frameworks don't use things that are old out of date uh, you know not reviewed not supported uh, things like that and um, you know a lot of these a lot of these patterns and you know these are just these are just three um, you know there are many 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 others and you know I'm happy to chat about them with folks afterwards but a lot of these patterns have crossover into under other industries and you know the security in the gaming industry as I alluded to earlier is very very focused on you know protecting the game client you know trying to make sure that people can't do you know in memory uh, in memory value exchanges and you know swapping out um, you know swapping out their low health for high health or you know giving themselves unlimited uh, unlimited gold things like that um, that's where a lot of research and focus has been on um, but all of the other all of the other necessary things to go into a well well designed and functional game you know have crossover into other industries where those things have been very very thoroughly reviewed and so you know as game designers and, and game developers and security uh, security professionals working in this industry you know we can pull from that experience and help integrate it into the the development process um, so we talked a little bit about the the trusted unbusted a little while ago but another question to just kind of consider and ask yourselves is you know not only what kind of risks um, does your users present to you your game you know in terms of piracy in terms of revenue loss all of that 
but what kind of risk does your game present to your users? For instance, if you're developing an inherently uh, insecure game, and I'll use an example here, is we found that um, you know, one, one studio that, that we were working with on, on one particular title were using a, you know, a custom developed uh, chat client within the game. So you know how you, you know, press like shift enter or whatever and you can chat with, with other people in the world and blast out messages or do peer to peer messages, whatever. Um, the thing was riddled with buffer overflows. And basically you could send out mass buffer overflow attacks to folks on, you know, on the world that you, that you were playing in um, you know, just via the chat client. You could send out your payload through the chat client and get remote code execution on everybody else's system. And of course, the, the game client was running as, as admin because it had to run as admin. God forbid it run as anything else. But, you know, ask yourself these questions is, you know, you, you have to consider both sides of the coin because they're both, they're both very important. If, if, that, if that flaw had made it out to, had made it out to production um, and it was discovered and exploited in the wild, it could have been absolutely disastrous for this company. Um, and you know, thank God it didn't. But you know, just something to consider. And you know, I kind of alluded to some of the values of um, you know some of, some of this stuff earlier in the talk. But um, you know, of course, defense in depth is an absolute must. You know, the more green boxes, um, if you're doing the asset control approach to threat modeling, the more green boxes you can have next to your sensitive assets or on the way to those sensitive assets, the better. Um, you know, make sure that if an attacker is going to compromise an asset, then they're going to have to go through a lot of pain and trouble and, you know, security testing wizardry to get to that asset. Um, you know, throughout your development process, make sure that you have various touch points, whether those are architecture discussions, whether those are pen tests, whether those are uh, code reviews or automated uh, code reviews, just checking for, you know, memory leakage issues or, um, you know, have network scanning uh, stuff going on, looking for, you know, vulnerable ports that are open, out-of-date software, things like that. Um, you know, have as many ch touch points as possible without, you know, grinding development to a halt because ultimately you want uh, security to be an enhancement to the product, not an inhibitor. Um, and that's, you know, a whole other topic in itself and, you know, as you move into DevOps land and, you know, automating all the things. Um, so, you know, using threat modeling to drive other security activities. So, you know, admittedly, this is a little bit of a heavier weight process than running, you know, a point and click scan or something like that, as I'm sure you, you know, can, can reason from this uh, from this presentation is you know it takes a lot of you know human thought and human you know intervention to kind of reason about how the system is put together you know think about what the attacks are going to be think about where everything has to live all of that and you know all of that human time spent on something you know is ultimately time spent that you know they can't go do other things and we don't yet have intelligent enough machines to do this stuff, or at least, you know, not that they're not intelligent enough, but we don't have the software necessarily to do all of this, given how complex some things are. <laughs> um, but I'm sure we'll get there someday, and that'll be that'll be fantastic. Um, so, also, uh, you know, these two, these last two things are kind of uh, intertwined together. But you know, consider the value of the asset that you're trying to protect. You know, ultimately, if you have that low value asset. You know that's not where you want to be throwing all of your your develop your security development and ser security engineering budget at. You want to be protecting all of the very high value assets. Um, you know it makes perfect sense when you when you step back and think about it. Uh, but we've seen many many organizations just redirect their security budgets in the exact wrong or opposite direction, and ultimately it's come back to bite them in uh, you know in negative ways. And um, yeah, so. Uh, wrapping up now, so does anyone have any questions or anything? And we've got about six minutes until we uh, flip the room into uh, into dinner and such and get more beer, so, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the question was, um, that well, focused around whether there has been any significant enhancements in DRM and whether it works any better nowadays? Um, the answer is kind of. Um, so there's a few new, um, 
you know, a few new uh, developments out there, like Microsoft is putting out, um, you know, putting out like their Play Ready service, and there's a few other companies who are kind of piggybacking on like the iTunes DRM, original DRM model, and like Kindle's DRM and stuff like that. But ultimately, there exists nothing out there currently that has not been broken. And in the research that I've done, a lot of the a lot of the DRM has focused mostly on you know, protection of physical media, and um, ultimately that ends up going more towards, uh, you know, protecting like the Blu-ray drive players and the, and the discs that are going out, you know, mostly movies on them. Um, and not a lot has gone into, you know, protecting games uh, because ultimately we're moving towards a very, very digital distribution model, um, or at least digital distribution heavy model um, for gaming. And like Steam, for instance, has actually done, um, you know, they're one of the, they're one of the bigger, um, you know, some people love them, some people hate them, um, but they're one of the, you know, kind of, they call themselves pioneers, and, and I kind of agree with them in this case, but what they're doing is they're doing account-specific, um, they're creating account-specific content encryption keys, and so, you know, when I have my Steam account, um, it will create a, 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 a content encryption key for my, for my account, and it'll encrypt a portion of um, whatever game binary I download. So if I want to download, um, you know, one of the new Star Wars games or the new GTA V game, um, it'll encrypt part of that um, part of that game client with my specific account key, and that account key is of course tied to my account. So when I go to another laptop or uh, you know a friend's PC, I can just log into my account, and um, you know, assuming that the game is there, I can. I can decrypt that part of it and, and go ahead and play the game, but other other users on that same system logged into their own Steam accounts won't have that same account key and be able to decrypt the same part of the um, the game client and get past it. So that's one of the one of the bigger, more popular approaches out there that I've seen right now. Um, you know, and, and a lot of folks are actually opting towards the you know to hell with DRM. We're just not going to do it and piss our users off and you know get money other ways. Hope that helps. Yep. Right. Yeah. So um, you know, it's more of a comment that the most legitimate and and effective DRM um, mechanism out there right now is to make it almost you know just built into the purchasing process and completely transparent to the users. And you know, DRM has a has a nasty reputation. You know, of course, publishers and producers and such want to protect their intellectual property, and who can blame them? Um, you know, but the biggest complaint against DRM has not been because these people want to protect their intellectual property; it's because it's an enormous pain in the ass. And yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, <laughs> yeah, so just uh, recounting the experience where um, I think I heard it all that, you know, the only um, version that worked was the one that was cracked running on top of the, the supposedly protected version. Um, and yeah, that's oftentimes what happens in the, um, in the pirating, uh, the pirating industry is people are, you know, you'll have the crackers who will, you know, show that they can crack or, or beat a game's DRM, and it happens in the homebrew community as well, is they just want to get around the system security and prove, you know, that they can do it. It's more of an intellectual curiosity. And then you have all the piraters who come in after the fact and actually try to make money off of it. Um, it's kind of a unique little black market in itself. So it depends on the uh, on the money. So there's been a few cases where, um, at least that we've been involved in, you know. So some of our clients, most of our clients rely on us in a um, in a very like advisory role where we help them, you know, throughout their SDLC, do testing and design reviews, all of that. Um, but when we get to a certain level of trust with some of our clients, we'll help them and advise them in somewhat of a uh, an incident response to, uh, capacity. And we've had a couple of cases where. Um, studios kind of putting out um, putting out marketplaces of sorts for you know new game content or new games uh, in themselves where they have a very very big social so it's almost like a social media 
um, component or extension of their organization. Um, and as soon as you have, you know, a YouTube video that, you know, shows how you can download everything on their site for free, um, or they see black market sites uh, pop up with everything at half off from, from their marketplace, um, we've seen that a few different times. And, you know, we've had to, like, go through it. You know, there's not really much you can do with the, with the black market stuff. You have to kind of, um, you know, take a, take a um, you know, plant your flag in the sand and say, you know, we're going to defend everything from this point forward. Um, and so it's, it's like a, an engineering madhouse where, you know, everyone is working, like, around the clock to figure out how to prevent, you know, how it happened, one, how to prevent just that. And then, you know, everyone's coding and designing things like nutcases. But, yeah, I mean, we've, we've observed it a few different times, um, at the weaponizing at scale. Um, but even if it's not weaponizing in the sense where you're monetizing things, um, weaponizing it in the sense where it's, you know, visible cheating at scale. So if somebody can put out a YouTube video and say, you know, download this free little utility that I, that I uh, created for free and install it on your system and it's going to allow you to, you know, win any match, um, you know, that visible element of cheating. Like if you just go online and, you know, some popular games and download like, you know, such and such cheats and you see a lot, a lot of times users won't play that game, uh, you know, thus impacting the revenue model. Yeah. So the question was uh, focused around the motivations of the attackers um, developing these hats, these hacks, and these bots, uh, things like that. Was that all right? Um, sorry, it's hard to hear up here. Uh, what's that? <coughs> right. So a lot of times, you know, it kind of circles back to the, um, you know, to the, um, you know, the very, very stereotypical hacker um, persona that we. Uh, that we brought up before. So, you know, that malicious user threat agent um, is very oftentimes, you know, doing it for more of a reputation boost. Um, so they want to show in their, you know, in their little, uh, you know, hacker inner circles that they're the ones to, you know, who broke this system, who did this thing. And that's why, you know, at some of the, um, uh, there's a few German, uh, German-based conferences that, um, and, and uh, RECON and Layer 1 down in L.A., um, who have, you know, a couple of these really kind of elite game hacker groups, um, uh, like C Forever, um, a couple of other names are escaping me, but the guys who do like the, like the console, uh, the console rooting, um, and the guys who found that, uh, the PlayStation 3, uh, was not using, um, was not using a secure random number generator in their, uh, um, in some of their, uh, encryption implementations, and thus we're able to uh, predict the um, uh, predict the master key used to sign all the binaries on the consoles, and thus be able to run any code that they want. And so, um, and they they just publish that out there, and they're like, you know, look at this cool shit that we can do. And they showed all the math behind it, and people are like, and you guys are awesome. So, you know, it's a lot of times that that threat agent is very much a um, you know a, a reputation or. A, you know, look what I can do kind of motivation. That's what we've seen anyways. And of course, every threat agent is going to have very different motivations. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, consider really any, any hacking stuff. Like, you know, we do this stuff because it's fun, right? and we get paid for it. <laughs> cool. And uh, I think they're getting ready to flip the room, so I'll end there. But I'll be around at the dinner and around tomorrow if anyone wants to catch up and chat. And uh, yeah, happy to chat.
All right, thank you very much for coming out. If you uh, did buy a VIP ticket or a speaker, please stick around uh, in our lounge. We're going to have some cocktails and uh, while we flip the room to dinner. Uh, and for the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>